Good morning. Um, so quiet out there. Daylight savings. Everyone's all sleepy still. Good morning. <laughs> I type, but I have a cat in my mouth. We're here. <laughs> Uh, I know it got me good. It always gets me good. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I'm also. so missing that hour of sleep. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Oh, well, we'll, we'll get over it, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So uh, last week we finished chapter two. And so um, today we're starting chapter three and we're kind of doing a little mixed bag here. Uh, I have decided to uh, skip, I know, right? Uh, we're gonna be skipping 3.1. Uh, 3.1 is on quadratics and we've actually spent a lot of time working with quadratics, right? AX squared plus bx plus c. So we're, we're really good at factoring using uh, the quadratic formula and we're, we've worked a lot with quadratics already. So um, it was supposed to be on graphing quadratics, but uh, I've got bigger things in mind for graphing. So I'm actually, um, I've decided to skip 3.1 and move straight to 3.2. And we're only doing 3.2, uh, which introduces polynomials and then 3.3. Uh, so we are doing uh, 3.2, which is just polynomials in general. And then we'll move on to 3.3, which is uh, long division, polynomial long division. It sounds terrible, but it's actually really fun. So uh, polynomial long division. And then we go to 3.6, uh, which is on rational functions. And that's why we kind of need some background on polynomials. Uh, because remember, a rational function is a polynomial over a polynomial. Ugh, looks bad, but it's, it's not, not too bad. Uh, rational functions, and we're going to focus on graphing them. And so that's kind of what we're going to be doing in chapter three here. So without further ado, um, Let's get into 3.2. So like I said, 3.2 just kind of introduces polynomials. Even though we've talked about polynomials already, in fact, a quadratic is a polynomial, right? So it's whenever we have uh, kind of terms with different powers of x's strung together with uh, addition or subtraction, right? So if we have section 3.2 is called polynomial functions, and their graphs and their graphs. Now, I don't want to uh, work so much on the graphs of polynomial functions. We'll focus on rational functions later. But um, I, I noticed on Moodle the, the order of the notes, I think the, the 3.6 notes are first and then it's 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, but um, so just they're there, they're just in the wrong order. I'll have to rearrange them under. <clears throat> so 3.2, uh, let's just talk about kind of the anatomy of a polynomial function. So. Let's bring our little blurb in here. Okay, so a polynomial function is anything with, uh, like we said, different powers of x uh, strung together with addition or subtraction, right? So you can have coefficients out in front uh, and how we denote those are a subscript n times x to the power of n, right? So my highest power is n and I can't remember if we've said it before. I feel like I, I've probably 
I uh, spilled the beans on this one already, but we call it a degree N. So whatever the highest power is, uh, is the degree. So the degree of the polynomial, the degree of the polynomial is uh, the value of the highest power of X. At the highest power of X. Yeah. So for example, uh, <clears throat> Just grabbing it from the notes, if we have 3x to the 5 plus 6x to the 4 minus 2x to the 3 plus, let's make it really big, x squared plus 7x minus 6. Right. Uh, here we see that we have degree five, right? So this is a polynomial degree five. Okay, so that tells us um, the overall shape of this thing. So that's gonna be really useful, right? Because uh, back in chapter two, we, we figured out some of the, the general shapes of graphs. So what happens is if we know the degree of the polynomial, then we know the overall behavior of this thing, right? So if we have x to the power of five is our, is our highest power, then overall we have this um, kind of x to the power of three, but a little bit sunken down uh, behavior, right? And so we, we already know what this thing is gonna look like overall based on the degree. So uh, a couple of other things that we should know, uh, all these a's, right? So all these a's in general out front of the x's, these are all coefficients, right? So we call this, uh, in general, we call these values. And I guess it includes the addition and the subtraction here. We call these coefficients. And this, First coefficient is a little bit special because it's called the leading coefficient, of course. So we've got these coefficients um, and depending on if they're positive or negative, we're gonna add or subtract them uh, in our polynomial. So uh, we've got our leading coefficient, we've got our degree kind of less important is uh, that this whole thing is called our leading term. And in fact, each of these little, I think of them as lumps, right? So each of these little uh, lumps there is called a term, right? And so making this first one our leading term. And then each of these Our terms. <clears throat> and then notice that this minus six doesn't have a, an x. Technically, it's uh, x to the power of zero, right? So here you, you do have an x, but it's x to the power of zero. Remember, anything to the power of zero is just one. So negative six times one is just negative six. So, so this is a special term uh, and this is our um, constant term. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so lots of terminology there, but uh, it's just so we're able to talk about polynomials and just kind of work with polynomials. Um, so we're all on the same page. So, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, we said all these a's out in the front, those are our coefficients. And then we have a, a constant term here at the very end, potentially. Um, and then uh, we've got our a to the n is our leading coefficient. Yeah, looks like we talked about all of those definitions, the leading term. Okay. 
Good. So uh, the overall behavior is going to depend on the leading term. Okay. So the overall behavior, the overall behavior of a polynomial, oops, behavior of a polynomial will depend on the leading term. One thing that I do want to point out too is that any one of these coefficients could be zero, right? So if I have zero times x squared, then uh, x squared term goes away, right? So we could always have uh, a zero coefficient if that term isn't available, right? So notice that we have x to the power of five, and then we have x to the power of four, x to the power of three, x to the power of two, x to the power of one, technically x to the power of zero, right? And so we have all the decreasing uh, powers of x. So we could always have a, a zero coefficient, right? Making that term go away. And we're gonna look more at that when we do our polynomial long division. So stay tuned. Uh, okay, so this overall behavior is outlined in this little blur that I'll bring in here. Okay, I'll make it nice and big because there's a lot of stuff on here. All right, so if you have some a uh, general polynomial here, right? So, so we're just opening up for any type of polynomial then, uh, and it's degree n, then um, depending on the sign of, remember a subscript n is the leading coefficient, right? So, uh, so depending on the sign of the leading coefficient, right? And we've already seen this, if you have um, x squared, Right? then you've got this parabola that's going up, up, up. But if you have negative x squared, then it flips, right? We talked about transformations, then it flips on the x-axis and now it's pointing down, right? And so we get that same behavior. Uh, notice here, if you have uh, an even degree polynomial, then in general, right? The overall shape, we don't know what happens here in the middle, Right, but overall the end behavior is going to behave like a, like a parabola, right? And so pointing up, pointing up. And then if the leading coefficient is negative, then it's gonna be pointing down both arms. Whereas if you have an odd degree, remember x to the power of three, what that looks like, looks like this little uh, kind of S looking shape, right? And so we know the overall behavior of some odd degree polynomial, let's say x to the power of three, right? And so then if I have negative x to the power of three, what happens is it flips the, the direction of the arms, right? And so that's what we're seeing here is, okay, we've got p as an odd degree, right? So think x to the power of three, right? So that's why it's so useful to know those general shapes uh, is because now, okay, I know what x to the power of three looks like. Uh, so then if you have an even degree, right, you're going to think x squared overall. Okay, so we're just talking about the end behavior now. Okay, but this is true uh, for, for any polynomial, polynomial, right? So you could see, uh, so do I have a, a big crazy example in here? Not really. Okay. Um, what is the end behavior of negative 42 x to the power of 27 minus 4x squared? plus 2x minus 1. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up here. I skipped a lot of terms, right? 
should be decreasing from x to the power of 27 all the way down to zero. But I just made all those coefficients zero, right? So, uh, so it doesn't have to be this long thing. But here, right, so notice I've got degree 27. Right? And I also have a negative uh, leading coefficient. Negative leading coefficient. So here, right, I know I have an odd degree, so I know I'm going to have kind of this S shape. Right? And then with the negative leading coefficient, well, then I know that it's going to switch. So now, right, I know that my overall behavior is going to look like something like this. Right? I have no idea what happens in here. Oh, that wasn't very helpful, was it? Let's pretend that it follows some sort of shape and isn't just random to scatter. Good. You can graph it in Desmos. I don't know if it, if it makes a real mess or anything, but uh, there might be some, some activity here origin, but in general, we know that as x goes to negative infinity, right? So let's outline that here, right? So here, as, oops, combined the two. As x goes to negative infinity, that was a very nice infinity there. Okay, good. So as x goes to negative infinity, what happens to the y values? It looks like my y values are going to positive infinity, right? We see y is going to, or I should write it out, y is going to positive infinity, <clears throat> right? And so what we say is we, we summarize this, and when we say is going to we can just write a little arrow. So I'll bring in that little uh, information piece here. <clears throat> okay. So what we do is we say, okay, as X goes to positive infinity, right? then what happens to y? Well, so then here in this case, if x is going to positive infinity, so now let's use this uh, little arrow notation, right? And so here I can say as x goes to positive infinity, right now I'm heading in the positive infinity direction, then what do we see here? We see this, this downward arrow in the y direction. So as x goes to positive infinity, y goes to negative infinity. And so here, this first one that we did, we can summarize as or write as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity. Okay. So we have that in this uh, summary here. Right. I guess they write it in the in a different order. It doesn't matter. So y goes to positive infinity as x goes to positive infinity, right? So that's if you have a positive leading coefficient, right? In our case, we found that um, y goes to negative infinity as x goes to positive infinity, right? And so uh, same thing in the negative direction. As x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity. Right, so it's just a way that we can summarize this end behavior uh, with some shorthand, right? Using that arrow notation. Okay. Uh, another thing I wanted to just point out is because there's a lot of terminology um, for the values of x where we cross the, the x-axis, right? And so if we go to here, our handout, 
I'm going to grab it here. So what I want to point out is that all four of these statements, they mean the same thing, right? And so here, these all mean the same thing. So what we're saying is that if P is a polynomial, right, and uh, the most basic polynomial that we've worked with, or kind of we've worked with easier ones like lines, but uh, let's say the quadratic, right? So a quadratic, we talked about the zeros of a quadratic where, uh, where it crosses the axis, right? So we've found those x-intercepts already, and we use those to factor the quadratic, right? So if P is a polynomial and C is a real number, then we can say that C is a zero of P, okay? um, which means that X equals C is a solution where this equation equals zero, right? So remembering that P of X here is, is really Y, right? Recall P of X is the output so you can think of that as the y-axis, right? And so thinking about our graph here on the x-axis, this is where p of x equals zero, right? And so really what we're saying is that c is a zero of, of p means that this is where it crosses the, the x-axis, right? And so uh, we can say that, okay, well then that value of C makes the overall equation equal to zero, fine, right? Because the output is zero. Uh, X minus C is a factor of P of X. And this is, so this third one is, is the one that we've used to factor quadratics, right? And so here uh, we used, three when we factored quadratics, when we factored quadratics using the quadratic formula. Remember, because we did, we found the values of X that make the equation equal to zero Right, so here we found the values uh, of x, so x equals c, where the equation was set would become zero, right? And then we said, well, and then I can generate my factors x minus c, right? Because when it is c, it should equal zero, right? And so then we said, okay, so that's how I'm going to generate my factors of this quadratic. And then, of course, C is an x-intercept of the graph, right? This, the solution is, uh, the solution, the zero, the root, they all mean the same thing. Uh, and that's where it crosses the x-axis, right? Get a little refresher, mostly on quadratics, actually. Um, the last thing I want to talk about in polynomials, so I am kind of skimming these, this handout a little bit, uh, but really, I guess we can talk about the intermediate value theorem. It's not important. Then why are we doing it? For completeness. <laughs> so the intermediate value theorem says that if you have, um, an output that's negative, and then you move along the curve a little bit and you find an output that's uh, positive, right? So you've gone from negative to positive or maybe the other way around, right? But if you have uh, outputs P of A and P of B of opposite signs, well then uh, logically, right? We can, we can conclude that at some point it must have crossed the X axis Right, and so at some value, the output must be zero, right? So here, if we find, if we find the output, the output at A is 
positive and the output at B, oops, I keep wanting to com combine all my, my words, output, but I wanted to write output for B. Uh, output at B is negative. The intermediate value theorem says that, well, some, somewhere between A and B, we must have crossed the x-axis, right? And so the intermediate value theorem, the intermediate value theorem says that at some point, at some point, and we'll call that uh, x equals c, we must have crossed the x-axis, right, making c an x-intercept. We must cross the x-axis, making x equals c, Mm, we've got lots of terminology, right? A solution, a root, uh, a factor even, right? Uh, x minus c, making x equals c uh, an x-intercept. Right, crosses the x-axis there. So nothing really crazy, but uh, when you do go into to calculus, right, we use this fact uh, quite a bit because maybe, maybe it's easy to find the outputs at A and B, but really, really tricky to find uh, the outputs where it actually crosses the x-axis, right? But if you're able to say that, no, at some point between uh, these two values and probably moving A and B closer and closer together, right, to try to pinpoint where it might cross the x-axis, uh, we'll use that quite a bit. Right, and so uh, even if we can't find the exact x-intercept, right, we can say that there must be one somewhere in this range. And so it's just kind of a, a little trick. Okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to skip the, the graphing polynomial functions, but I do want to point out that even though uh, it looks kind of scary, we've actually done steps one and two already. So uh, you know how to factor a polynomial and uh, that's where this, the division of the polynomials is going to come in handy. Um, and so you know how to find the zeros of the polynomial. And then we're going to make a table of values to see where this graph is above the x-axis and where is it below the x-axis. We've done that in uh, when we dealt with inequalities in section 1.8, right? And so we're not going to do this graphing, but I do want to point out that we have seen it before because that can be a little bit scary. So here, uh, I do want to say we will focus on rational functions, right? So graphing rational functions, but also we did this, right? So we did steps one and two uh, back in section 1.8 when we dealt with inequalities. So it's the same procedure and we're actually going to use it again in 3.6. So that's why I'm just skimming it now. But then knowing the end behavior and then just having some idea of what this graph looks like, uh, we are able to sketch a graph. Right? So that's what we would be doing. Uh, we did this in section 1.8, which was on inequalities. Okay, 
the last thing I want to do is look at <clears throat> if you have so you have a zero or you have a solution or you have a root, an x-intercept, remember those all mean the same thing. So if C is a zero of P, and then we're introducing this new idea of multiplicity M, we've actually seen it before, we didn't really do anything with it, but uh, if you have a factor that happens more than once, right? So then you have multiplicity, uh, if it happens twice, you'd have multiplicity two, or if it happens to the power of five times, right, then uh, you'd have multiplicity five, right? Then what happens is it affect the shape of the graph near this x-intercept, right? So if, uh, if the multiplicity is odd, right, then what happens is it's gonna go through the, the x-axis, right? So it'll just go right through, so it'll start below and then it'll move its way up through, through C. Whereas if you have an even multiplicity, what happens is it kind of comes down or it comes up depending on um, the, if the leading coefficient is positive or negative, right? So depending on if it's facing up or facing down, right? So it'll come down on the x-axis. And then if it's gonna happen more than once, right? It kind of just bounces off and it, it goes up again. So, show you what I mean. Uh, an example here. Let's grab. Mm -hmm. Let's grab these examples. Just have a look at one. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at uh, you know what? Let's do twenty nine. Twenty nine looks kind of fun. Twenty nine says that we have this polynomial p of x is x to the three times x plus two times x minus three squared. Because it's already factored, right? I know that if x is zero, right, this whole thing would go to zero. So x equals zero is um, is a root, right, or a solution. And so here, I cross the x-axis at x equals zero. Moving on to the next kind of uh, the factor. Here, x plus 2, well, this tells me that I'm going to cross the x-axis at x equals negative 2, right? If I let x be negative 2, x plus 2 goes to 0. So here, also interested in x equals negative 2. x minus 3 tells me that uh, when x is positive 3, I'm going to cross the x-axis, right, because 3 minus 3 makes 0. So I've got a couple of points of interest here, right, 0, negative 2, and positive 3 are all going to be x-intercepts. Okay. So uh, now we want to know, okay, is it going to bounce off? Right? Is it going to bounce off the, uh, the x-axis? Well, that's only if you have an even multiplicity. Right? Whereas uh, <laughs> uh, if you have an odd multiplicity, it'll go straight through. Right? And so same, same for, uh, this is only for m larger than 1, but it's actually for a multiplicity of 1. But then there's no multiplicity. Right? So here, x to the power of 3, well, that's, that's x to the power of 0, but 3 times, right? So here we see we have multiplicity m, or multiplicity 3, on 
the x plus 2, we have a multiplicity of 1. So not really a multiplicity at all, right? It just happens once and then we forget about it. So uh, it'll just behave the way we think it does, just cross the x-axis. Um, x minus 3 has multiplicity 2. So if we had to sketch this behavior, and we don't actually, uh, we might be a little bit off because um, we can't see, uh, although I can tell that my leading coefficient is positive, right? And so, uh, but if I expanded this thing, the overall behavior would be like x to the power of 3 times x times x squared because I would need to expand this all out. But what I want to do instead is we can graph this in Desmos to see uh, what the graph looks like. And then we can confirm this, uh, all these multiplicities that we were stating. So let me see here, where is Desmos? And we can just put in um, the factors, right? So we have x to the power of three, step it down, times, and which one was it? X plus two times X minus three to the power of two. Okay, so here, right, notice that it crosses the X axis where, where we said it would cross the X axis, right? And so let me see, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to work this thing, but I'm feeling pretty confident. That I can just bring it in here. Aha. Uh -huh. So we can talk about it. Okay. So let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger here. There. All right. So what we're seeing here is x equals zero, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know, I'm so proud. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we see here that at x equals zero, that is an intercept, right? And then here, x equals negative two, we knew that as well, right? And then x equals positive three. So just from all these factors, we already knew there was going to be activity at these three points around the x-axis, right? We didn't know the overall behavior, and, and we're not going to get into that, um, but that's okay, right? And so we can use Desmos to graph it. So what we're finding is that, okay, we said we had uh, an odd multiplicity here at x equals zero, which looks good to me, right? Because we said an odd multiplicity right here is going to look like uh, something like this, or it can look like this depending on, um, depending on the function, right? But in general, we've got this kind of going through the x-axis behavior, right? And so that's what we're seeing down here, right? We're coming from down below and then we're heading up and we just head straight through the x-axis. At uh, x equals negative two, right, that's down here, we said, well, there's nothing special going on here. In fact, there's no multiplicity, so it's just gonna behave like we, we think all things behave, right? So through negative two, uh, and it looks like it's just coming from up above and going uh, down, okay? And then we said at x equals three here, we have multiplicity two. So this is where we have uh, an even multiplicity. And that's when, at least in my mind, I think of it as kind of uh, coming down on the x-axis and then just kind of bouncing off because it happens twice, right? And so uh, it can't just go through, it gets bounced off. Um, and so that's how I remember it. But whatever you need to do to kind of remember what it means to have uh, an even multiplicity, right? And so here we're coming down at x equals three and then we're bouncing off. Uh, and then, yeah, like I said, in my mind, it, it kind of makes it feel like 
uh, x equals three happened twice, right? Bouncing off. Good. Oh. All right. You've got the questions, I guess. So, great. That's about all I wanted to do for kind of the graphs of polynomials, right? So we'll need that. So we'll kind of parking lot that information uh, for next day when we talk about rational functions. Okay. Uh, but like I said, we're doing polynomial long division. Um, so let's get to it. I think it's really, really fun. And it's not fun in the beginning when you're just learning it, but once you once you figure out, okay, this is how I'm gonna do these, uh, it, it gets to be really fun. So 3.3 .3 is called dividing polynomials. And I maybe, do you guys want a quick caffeine break? Maybe a, a five minute nap? <laughs> Let's do a little, because uh, now's a, a kind of a good time to, to have a break. So we'll break for five minutes, uh, break until 8.50. How about that? Let's do it. Okay, so power nap. Dividing polynomials, the reason we want to be able to divide polynomials, there are a couple of other reasons, but the main reason for me is if I'm having a hard time factoring something and, and I'm you know, I, I want to factor out a certain polynomial out of another polynomial, then the way to do that is by dividing those polynomials, right? And so, uh, for example, if I want to factor out uh, a factor of four from seven, right, even though seven is not a, a multiple of four, I can still do that, right? I can still pull out four from seven, it just uh, makes it look a little bit weird, um, right? And so, same idea, but for polynomials. Yeah. And what you'll see on the handout is that uh, it's kind of, it's split up into two ways that we can do it. So the first is called long division of polynomials. This is the method that I'm going to use. Also synthetic division, uh, which I'm not gonna bother with uh, because I, I only like, to focus on one kind, right? If we if we can do things multiple ways, I like to just stick to one way. Uh, but you're welcome to to study synthetic division as long as you remember that synthetic synthetic division only works if you're trying to factor out x minus c, right? And so if you're trying to factor out anything but something in the form of x minus c, it's not going to work. Okay, so. Uh, Right, and so here, uh, there are two ways to divide polynomials. The first is through long division. And the second is through synthetic division. I will point out long division always works. Right? Whereas synthetic division will only work, only works if we are dividing by x minus c. Right, so if you're trying to divide by x squared plus four, for example, right, or maybe even a bigger polynomial, then synthetic division isn't gonna work anymore, right? And so it can only handle division by x minus c, uh, but that's fine. 
Uh, but for that reason, because long division always works, I am going to only use long division. Right. And so here, since long division will always work, will always work, I will only use long division. Right. I like to have a surefire thing. Um, even if a question asks you to use synthetic division, I'm just going to use long division. It, it doesn't matter, right? There are just two ways of dividing polynomials, right? And so here I do want to make a note, right, that even if a question, even if a question says, and I'm thinking about some uh, assignment and test questions that you have to do on WebAssign. Uh, sometimes it'll say use synthetic division, but in your mind, I just want you to say, okay, well, you're allowed to use synthetic division, but you can also use long division, right? So even if a question says use synthetic division, uh, we will use long division. But I do want to say here, uh, you are welcome to teach yourself, to teach yourself synthetic division. Ah. Um, so you are welcome to use synthetic division if you want to. So if you read it and it makes more sense to you, then that's that's great. As long as you remember that you can only handle division uh, by x minus c, right? So nothing nothing bigger. If you want to. Okay. So let us bring in this little blurb that's going to tell us everything, all the words we need to know. Okay. So if you have some polynomial P of X and D of X, okay, as long as we're not trying to divide by zero, right? So that's what it's saying here is as long as D of X is not equal to zero, then there exist unique polynomials q of x and r of x, where r of x is either zero uh, or of some degree less than the degree of um, the divisor. I call it the divisor, but you can also call it the dividend. Um, dividend? Maybe that's why I call it the divisor. And I'm not sure how to say the other one. Um, so. I want to say dividend, but it might be divided. I don't know. Uh, so R of X is the remainder, right? So it's either going to be zero if you've pulled out a, a factor of the of P of X, right? Or it's going to be something smaller than uh, than what you were dividing by. So what we say is we have P of X over D of X, right? We can either write it as Q of X, which is the, the quotient. Okay? And so here, um, uh, after dividing, and it's kind of hard to talk about without having seen any division, but we'll get there. After dividing P of X by D of X, we will have uh, the quotient Q of X. We will have the quotient Q of X, okay, which is um, kind of the whole number. If you think about uh, our example of seven over four, right? It would be the whole number. Uh, it would be the quotient. 
and then the decimal portion would be the remainder, right? And so uh, Q of X, so we'll have a quotient Q of X and a remainder R of X, okay? So we've got a couple of different components here, right? We've got P of X is being divided by D of X and then we'll end up with a quotient and a remainder. Right, and then there are actually two different ways that we could we could write this um, this result, right? And so here, right, we could write it as we can write the result. Oops. We can write the result two different ways. They're equivalent. Uh, the web assigned questions will, will ask you for uh, the answer in a specific way, but as long as we know how to find Q of X and R of X, then we can, we can put those things together however they, they ask us to, right? And so we can write these in two different ways. First one being P of X over D of X equals Q of X, right? So the whole number essentially, plus R of X over D of X, right? So the remainder over the, the divisor, right? D of X. Or the other way, right? P of X is D of X times Q of X plus R of X. So then P of X, notice all that's happened here is if I multiply this D of X over to the right-hand side, right? So here, uh, oops, we can multiply uh, both sides by, P, uh, by D of X. So we can multiply both sides by D of X to find and what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out um, this equation first, and then I'm going to multiply by D of X just to show you what happens. So to find that P of X over D of X becomes Q of X plus R of X over D of X. But then if I multiply both sides by D of X, I can do that. Right, because now this D of X and D of X are gonna cancel. And then when I expand this D of X inside, right, it actually also cancels with the D of X down here. So then I end up with P of X equals Q of X times D of X plus R of X over D of X times D of X. But then, of course, d of x over d of x is going to go to 1. So then I'm left with p of x is q of x times d of x plus r of x. <clears throat> Sorry, just. Sorry, stayed on mute. Um, okay, so that's how we get from, from one to the other. So uh, you don't need to memorize these. Usually it'll just say, write, give your answer in this, in this format. Uh, and often, because it's just a matter of constructing the answer, as long as you've found Q of X and R of X, then I'm, I'm happy. So usually I just end it there, okay? So you can construct your answer either way, doesn't matter. 
Well, let's get to the hard part, finding Q of X and R of X. So uh, let's see here. Um, after finding, after finding Q of X and R of X, we can construct our answer. We can construct our answer um, in either of the two ways. The two ways. Um, I will clarify that it's often specified in web assign, right? So uh, often specified in web assign. Okay. Shall we do some long division? Okay, so uh, let's see here. If we go to, so the handout actually does go through and it has the full solutions of how you do this long division. So I, I'm, I'm gonna leave that one for you in case you need another example to work through. Uh, but what I want to do is I just want to grab one of these problems down here and we'll use it kind of, we'll do it by way of example. So let's see here. So here it says two polynomials, P and D, are given. Use either synthetic or long division. So we, of course, are going to use long division. Um, to divide p of x by d of x and express the quotient p of x over d of x in this form. So now they're telling us, okay, write it in this form, write your answer in this form. Uh, so we've got all these p of x's and d of x's. And the first one we want to do, we want to start nice and slow. Uh, let's do question three. So three says we have p of x equals 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. And then we're told that d of x is x minus 2. This is, uh, you could use synthetic div division here, right? Because you have uh, something, so you're dividing by x minus c, right? And so here, let's just highlight uh, that x minus c where C is two. Right. So you could use synthetic division if you wanted to, but we're just gonna use line division. Okay, so we wanna take P of X divided by D of X. And so uh, we wanna find P of X divided by d of x, right? But what we're gonna do is uh, remember from probably, I don't know, grade school, um, maybe I don't, I don't know when you learn uh, long division, I um, can't remember, but uh, we use this little kind of division symbol, right? And so uh, it's gonna be easier if we write it with that, um, division symbol. I don't know what it's called. Uh, so find P of X over D of X by first writing D of X is going into P of X. Okay, so remember you've got your, your divisor here on the outside and then your, uh, shoot, what's, what's it called? Is that the div dividend, dividend? Ugh. It's whatever's being divided by the divisor. That's, ugh. anyways, as long as you keep them straight. The numerator goes underneath, the denominator goes outside. So that's our first step. We're gonna write uh, d of x going into p of x, which is of course what we want. So here, uh, make sure you leave at least one, one row 
in your writing uh, above the, the division because we're going to put uh, the quotient up top. So here, what I have is in this case, I'm going to write x minus 2 is going into 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. Okay, so what you do is you take your uh, leading term of d of x, so the divisor, and then you divide it into the leading term of p of x, okay? So here, I'll just do the steps kind of alongside here. So step one, divide the leading term of d of x, of d of x, uh, which is x in this case, in this case, x, into the leading term of p of x, which in this case, looking at it, right, 2x squared. And then, so step two, or maybe it's part of step one, I don't know, uh, is going to be, let's call it step two, we'll have a billion steps. Uh, step two, you're going to write the result up above, right, and so here, this is what we call the quotient. So this is kind of a holding block for the quotient q of x. Okay. And so what we do is we write the result from step one up in the quotient up here. Okay. So uh, write the result. Technically, it has to go above the leading term, right? So you're going to put it above the term that you divide it into. Uh, so write the results above the leading term of p of x, above the leading term of p of x uh, in, in the quotient. Okay. okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to just ignore everything else and just look at 2x squared divided by x. Right? And so here what happens is you have um, 2x squared divided by x. And now I'm just going to uh, do all this work. Usually I would end up doing this work maybe on a, a spare piece of paper or I might just kind of do it in my head if it's something nice like this uh, or maybe over in the margin. So it's not actually part of the work that we're doing, but, but we do have to do it, right? So 2x squared divided by x uh, gives me 2x, right? And so the result here is 2x and so I have to put 2x up top there. So now, okay, now what we do is we're going to take this 2x and we multiply it down by x minus 2, but then we put the result down here below p of x, okay? So here, let's see here, I'm gonna take up a little bit more room. Step three, we multiply uh, the result, right, in q of x, we multiply uh, the result from q of x, by d of x, then subtract it from p of x. That's confusing, right? But once you see the, the pattern, uh, it's going to be okay. So we multiply the results 
from Q of X by D of X, then subtract it. Oops. from P of X. Okay. So this is going to look like where we're at so far, X minus 2, 2X two squared minus 5X minus 7, just jotting down the, the question again. Where we've got to so far is that we have 2X in the quotient, right? So we have 2X up here. So now what you're going to do is, okay, so we multiply this 2x, multiply this 2x by x minus 2, okay? And then if we're trying to subtract it from p of x, what we do is you line them up below p of x down here. So we're going to write the results and then we're going to remember to subtract. So this becomes 2x times x, putting me at 2x squared. Plus 2x times negative 2 puts me at negative 4x, right? So minus 4x. Okay. So here, I'll just underline in pink what we did here. And then in green, we're going to subtract it from P of X by doing this, right? So you have to have brackets around 2X squared minus 4X, and then we're going to subtract it. Noticing that I can, I can work with these polynomials just like uh, numbers as long as you're subtracting 2X squared. You can, you can write them out on the same level, right? You'd have to collect like terms. But that's really what you've done here by stacking uh, the same powers of x on top of each other. And so that so you are collecting like terms here. So the key is the reason we do this is so that the two x squared goes away, right? And so if you're finding that the leading term isn't uh, kind of dissolving because it's taken care of, uh, then something went wrong. Right, so you have 2x squared minus 2x squared, which puts me at 0, right? 0x squared if you want. Then I have negative 5x minus negative 4, right? So negative 5 plus 4 puts me at minus 1x. Um, or just minus x uh, is usually what we write, right? And so here I'll just write this negative x. Okay. Our fourth step is we're going to make a, a new p of x by bringing down this uh, everything that hasn't been worked with already from p of x, right? And so how do I phrase that? Step four. Bring down, bring down any terms from P of X that haven't been used, right? So in this case, that minus seven, that constant minus seven hasn't been used, uh, that haven't been used. So bring down any terms from P of X that haven't been used uh, to make a new P of X, right? So I'm calling it a, a new P of X to make a new P of X, right? It's going to behave the same way that the old P of X did, except it's going to have a, a smaller degree, right? So here we had degree two, but now we're going to have degree one. And so what happens is we keep decreasing the degree until we can't decrease it anymore. So uh, let's see here. Let's write it out. So where we're at here is we have x minus 2. We have 2x up top, 2x squared minus 5x minus 7 
minus, so I'm just writing out what we've done already, minus four, uh, minus two x squared plus four x, zero minus x. And then what happens here is minus seven gets brought down because we still need to take care of it. Okay. Now what we do is we repeat this procedure, right, until we, uh, our highest power of x down here is less than the highest power of x in d of x. Okay. So then step five, I guess, repeat this procedure until, um, until the new p of x, right? So at, at each step, you're gonna find a new p of x, right? When you bring down all these terms. So this here is what I'm calling our uh, kind of quote unquote new p of x. Okay. So until the new p of x uh, has a smaller degree than d of x. has a smaller degree than d of x. Because then if, if you're trying to divide um, negative x minus seven divided by x squared minus two, for example, then uh, we would be done, right? So you just, you go until the degree of your new p of x is less than what you're trying to divide it by. Um, so, okay, here we go. Let's keep working on this. So what I'm gonna do again is I'm just gonna rewrite everything that we have done so far, right? And then we'll go through the next steps. So here I'm gonna have x minus two is going into two x squared minus five x minus seven. 2x up here, minus 2x squared minus 4x. Once I do that, I get 0 minus x minus 7. So now, right, if we're repeating this whole procedure, now you can kind of ignore this 2x it's already dealt with. So now we're, we're basically starting fresh, right? So here, now I have negative x divided by x, right? So we start, we take the leading term of p of x and we divide it by the leading term in d of x. So we get, um, oops, uh, negative x, let me just do it over here. Negative x divided by x makes negative one. So I'm gonna put that here, minus one. And notice that I'm stacking it on top of uh, that one that I divided, the leading term, right? So now two X uh, minus one is my overall quotient, but the quotient that I'm interested in uh, when I multiply here is just the negative one. And I don't think I was perfectly clear with that earlier, uh, but you just take the, the most current part of the quotient that you worked on. So you have, now you have to take negative one times x minus two, right? And so if we write that out, right, then you have negative x, negative one times negative two makes plus two. And then we have to subtract that Right? So make sure you put brackets around there. And uh, kind of the biggest mistake that I see is you, you forget, you, you bring in the negative on the first term, but then you forget to bring in the negative on the second term and it just makes a mess, right? And so what we end up with here is, let's see here, negative X and then minus negative X Remember the whole goal is for it to kind of dissolve, right? So it makes sense. So negative X plus X makes zero. 
And then we have negative seven minus positive two, right? And so negative seven minus two, so I have minus nine, right? And so here, now, a couple of things to note. Uh, first of all, the degree here is less than, right? So here I have degree one, and here I have degree zero, right? So degree zero, so we are finished. Right? Because here we have degree one. Okay. So what this means is that our overall quotient, so Q of X that we found here is two X minus one. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Uh, what color can I use? Maybe orange. So here, this is saying that Q of X overall is gonna be two X minus one. Okay. And then, Right, much like normal division, if if uh, if that feels familiar or kind of even vaguely familiar, right here, all that's left over is negative nine, uh, and that's going to be my remainder. Right, and so here, whatever is left, whatever is left is the remainder r of x. Okay. So definitely tricky, but how about we do another example where we just kind of um, work through another one. Um, just a second. Busy day. Uh, okay, so we have our Q of X and our R of X, and generally I'm I'm okay with just leaving them there, right? But let's just practice. I forgot we should practice uh, constructing our answer both ways, right? We have two different ways that we can construct our answer. Um, so let's do that. So we have found that. Um, we can construct our answer, our answer in two ways, right? Going uh, Q of X and R of X now, right? That's what we said was the hard part, but now we, we have them, okay? It took us a little bit, but uh, so we can say that P of X over D of X equals Q of X plus r of x over d of x. And maybe if I scoot this over, I can have them kind of side by side. Or uh, p of x equals q of x d of x plus r of x. So now it's just a matter of plugging in uh, the values that I have for this problem. And so I can say that P of X was uh, 2X squared minus 5X minus 7 divided by X minus 2 equals, okay. So now we can, we can kind of see, oh, okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm dividing by X minus 2. So I'm pulling out a factor of X minus 2 and looking at the result. So, we found Q of X was 2X, let it catch up. Uh, we found that Q of X was 2X minus one. Right? And then uh, R of X was negative nine. So we have uh, 2X minus one 
plus negative nine was our R of X. Right, that's our remainder divided by X minus two, right? Because it's not a, a whole remainder, it's, it's uh, some fraction of X minus two. So what we get here is we get two X minus one minus nine divided by X minus two. Pretty cool, right? So uh, it's nice to be able to do that kind of hefty division and be able to, right? If you're, if you're desperate to pull out an X minus two from something like this, it doesn't work out. It, it doesn't factor nicely, but we, we can find what it is, right? And so now we've, we've pulled out that factor of X minus two. Or if we prefer to write it in uh, this way, right? We're just kind of nibbing together all our answers. And so P of X was two X squared minus five X minus seven. And make this actually look like a two. Q of X was two X minus one. And maybe I'll make, give myself a little bit more room here. Uh, <laughs> D of X is X minus two plus R of X, which was negative nine. So I'm just gonna write as, well, it's our first one. So plus negative one. Notice that now I have these nice looking factors, right? So it's a little bit uh, cleaner to look at, right? But then I also have that pesky negative nine as the remainder, right? And so I get, 2x minus 1 times x minus 2 minus 9. Just two different ways that we can cobble together those answers. So like I said, the, the hard part is finding q of x and r of x. And then putting them together uh, however they want them is, is the easy part. So let's do another example uh, doing this polynomial long division. Let's do uh, let's do five from the handout. Maybe I'll underline it. Show that we're we've done it. Uh, you know what? Fresh page and everything here. Okay. So now. I've got 4x squared minus 3x minus 7 divided by 2x minus 1. So notice that I don't have something in the form of x minus c anymore, right? So here, I wouldn't be able to use synthetic division anyways. So we'd have to use long division. So that's why I'm just sticking with long division. OK, so uh, following those steps that we outlined earlier, right? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite P of X over D of X as D of X going into P of X. And so what I get is I have 2X minus 1 going into 4X squared minus 3X minus 7. Okay. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to kind of put my scrap work over here. Right? So somewhere, somewhere else, maybe even in your head, uh, you're going to be doing some, some kind of quick math here. But I like to just write it down. It makes it easier. So remember, our first step is to take the leading term of p of x, which in this case is 4x squared. So we're going to take 4x squared and divide it by the leading term of d of x, which in this case is 2x. So that we can do, right? 4x squared divided by 2x. 4 divided by 2 makes 2. x squared divided by x just makes x. So I get 2x. And you should always kind of make sure that when you multiply this back, you should get to 4x squared. Right? So now, can't remember if we called it step two or step three, but now we write this answer, we write it up top, 
uh, above p of x and specifically the, the term of p of x that we just divided into. So we have 2x up here. Okay. So now I take this 2x and then now I take it back and I multiply it, but I multiply it by 2x minus 1. And so 2x times 2x minus 1, remembering that the goal is to cancel out this 4x squared. So you should end up with 4x squared uh, as, your, as your first term here. So let's do 2x times 2x minus 1 makes 4x squared minus 2x. And that's going to go down here, 4x squared minus 2x. And then we have to subtract that. Okay. So now the subtraction is not bad. 4x squared minus 4x squared, as long as you remember to bring that negative inside onto all the terms. Right, and so 4x squared minus 4x squared is going to be 0. And then negative 3x minus negative 2x is negative 3 plus 2x, right? So that's going to be minus x. And then our next step, right, remember is we have to bring down any terms that haven't been uh, kind of manipulated already, right? So now I bring down this minus 7, so I get negative x minus 7. And now I treat that as my new uh, p of x. So now we just started all over again, right? But notice, uh, until I can't divide by x anymore. So x, I can still divide by 2x, right? But once I get to a, a whole number, I won't be able to divide by 2x anymore. So here we go again. All right. So now I have negative x, which I'm going to divide by 2x. So I have negative x divided by 2x, which makes it makes negative 1 half. Negative 1 over 2. That's OK. It's OK. We can have fractions that it works. Right? And so x over x is going to cancel, and all I'm left with is negative 1 over 2. And so here I have minus 1 half. We don't like fractions, right? I think I'm not alone when I say I don't like fractions, uh, but we can, we can deal with them, right? We have the tools. So now, right, a little bit trickier because now what I have to do is I have to multiply negative 1 half by 2x minus 1. So, OK, here we go. Uh, I'm running out of colors here, but I'm going to take negative 1 half times 2x minus 1. So if I multiply that negative 1 half inside, I get negative x plus 1 half. Okay. So now I, I take this negative x plus 1 half, and I have to subtract it from negative x minus 7. So it looks bad, but it actually it works out negative x plus 1 half. And then I have to subtract it. OK. Negative x minus negative x is negative x plus x, which of course goes to zero. So that's how I, I kind of know I'm on the right track here. Right? And then I need to take negative 7 minus a half. Right? So negative 7 minus a half, I'm going to need common denominators. right? And so uh, here, kind of over on the side again, I need to find negative 7 minus 1 over 2. But if I multiply this by 2 over 2, I get negative 14 over 2 minus 1 over 2, which is 
negative 15 over 2. All right. So that you might have to do kind of on the side somewhere. It's not something that I, I need to see anymore because I, if you get to the right answer, you, you know how to deal with uh, uh, fractions. So that's okay. Um, so here, negative seven minus a half, we found becomes negative 15 over two. I'm gonna leave it as a fraction. So I get minus 15 over two. So here, now this, the degree here is zero. The highest uh, power of X that I was dividing by was one, right? So now I can stop. So what this says is that, um, let's see if I can, if you can see, no, it's not really visible. Here, I'll do this. Now we found that Q of X is two X minus one half, and I'll highlight this one here, and R of X is negative 15 over two. Great. So once you have Q of X, no matter how kind of uh, ugly looking, right? Two X minus one half, yuck. Uh, and then R of X, negative 15 over two, also not that nice looking, right? So once you have them, then you can construct your answer uh, in any way you'd like. Okay. So uh, there are a couple of cool properties that I want to talk about uh, before we kind of, well, probably end today. Uh, and then we'll start off with a couple more examples. But what I want you to do is uh, I do want you to try all of these, right? So try uh, solving a lot of these on your own. Try solving as many of these as you can, as many of these probably using long division just to have that practice. But if you have already mastered synthetic division on your own, then that's great. You can use synthetic division when it's appropriate. Uh, so try solving as many of these using long division uh, as you can on your own. And then next day, I want to do 11 and 14. We will do 11 and 14 next day. So I'm going to hold off on those because there are a couple of different properties that I want to talk about. Uh, so it's called the, 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 the remainder and the factor theorem. So the remainder theorem says, and it, it's kind of a Hey, what happened? Where is it? It's gone. It's a it's a blank page. What's going on here? There's supposed to be a second page. Uh, okay. Do you guys have a second page in your handout? That is so weird. Okay. Let me just go. Let's see here. Now, of course, you do have a second page, right? I don't know why I don't have a, and now it's nothing's working. Let me go here. Three point. Yeah, this page. Mm -hmm.
just added the first page over again. Driving me nuts. Create a new note. Let's see if that works. Finally. Okay. So, okay. So the remainder theorem is kind of a cool little theorem that we have. And what it says is that, and we've kind of already used it when we're factoring quadratics, right? And so um, if a polynomial is divided by x minus c, so notice that that's the special case where we can use synthetic division, right? And so, but we'll use long division just to keep it simple. Uh, so then the remainder, right? So the remainder, remember, is r of x. The remainder is actually uh, p of c. So it's the polynomial evaluated at c, right? So that's kind of weird, right? Um, but, but also kind of a cool, cool thing. Right, and so what it says is that uh, if p of x is divided by x minus c, and once we've done that work, we find q of x, so it's equal to q of x plus r of x over x minus c, right? then r of x equals p at c. Okay. So what we're going to do, we've already seen uh, the first example that we did, right? Let's bring that back so we can look at what this is actually saying. Right. So consider uh, question three. Oh, it's actually just above here. Question three that we did, right? We were taking, uh, we were dividing by x minus two, right? So all good here. And uh, we have q of x and we have r of x. So let's see here. Oops. I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna kind of Clean it up a bit. So consider uh, from question three, I'm going to remove this degree. We don't need that note. We don't need to know how we got there. Don't need this anymore. We don't need this. And just cleaning it up a bit. Here, r of x equals negative nine. So what we had, right, is we had our p of x, 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. And then our d of x is x minus 2. So we've got p of x, d of x, q of x, and r of x. I'm just going to list them here. So we have p of x was 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. And we have d of x is x minus 2. And we already established that this is like x minus c, where c equals 2. And then we also found that q of x we established was 2x minus 1. And then r of x equals negative 9. So what the remainder theorem here is saying is that, OK, I've divided my p of x by x minus c. 
then the remainder r of x must be equal to the polynomial evaluated at c. So that's kind of weird, All right? So the remainder theorem says, the remainder theorem says um, p evaluated at c equals 2. Right? Or maybe I should just say at 2 is equal to r of x, which is negative 9, which we can try, right? So if we actually evaluate p of 2, it becomes 2 times 2 squared minus 5 times 2 minus 7, which 2 times 4 is 8 minus 10, negative 2 minus 7 is negative 9. And so what we're seeing here is that P of C is equal to R of X, right? And so that's kind of a, a weird quirk um, of these things. So it's a quick way to evaluate a function, especially a huge function. Uh, if it works out to be easier to do long division uh, than actually evaluating the function, then you can use the remainder theorem. All right, I know I'm out of time. So, but try some of those uh, problems, right, on your own and work through them. And then uh, we will go through 11 and 14 for review next day. And also the factor theorem, just briefly. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you Thursday. Thanks, guys.